journey of these great three days and remain faithful with Christ to the cross, holding in our hearts the hope and promise of the empty tomb. As we come together for this very special service, you are welcome here and please do make sure you get an Alban bun on your way home. As we gather today, we give thanks to God for the mission and ministry across our diocese. So be assured here in your cathedral, you are all in our prayers as together we welcome and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So just a reminder then that at the offertory hymn today, there will be a collection to support that mission and ministry in which we share. And we invite one another to be generous to that. Welcome as we gather in worship and in the flurry of these days, which involves us all, pray that these are moments of peace and renewal for us all. Welcome.
be with you. Good morning and a warm welcome to our Chrism Eucharist with Blessing of Oils. First of all, um, I bring greeting from Bishop Allen, who remains in our prayers, who is doing well um, and who we miss this morning. Uh, secondly, it's a huge joy and privilege to share with all of you this service as together we renew and affirm um, our baptismal calling and for those called to particular ministries to renew our vocation under God. We worship together. Come, let us return to the Lord and pray. Lord. Sin, we have avoided your call. Our love for you. The Lord enrich you with his grace and nourish you with his blessing. The Lord defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. The Lord accept your prayers and absolve you from your offences. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Heavenly Father, who anointed your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and with power, to bring to the world the blessings of your kingdom, anoint your church with the same Holy Spirit, that we who share in his suffering and his victory may bear witness to the gospel of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, 
How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send to you Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to the sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one who I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, saying, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shemaiah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him. For this one, this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it's by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is the word of the Lord.
among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the Gospel of the Lord. All of us here today who hold the bishop's license or permission to officiate as authorised lay ministers, readers, deacons, priests or bishops have, by the nature of our vocation and calling, been called into leadership roles within the body of Christ. We have been called to lead. We've been recognised as people who have been given authority. When we speak and act, we do so representing God and God's people. But we are also people who are called to serve. For quite a while now, I have pondered over the question of how we hold authority well? How do we exercise the leadership and authority granted to us well and in a Christ-like way? We are seemingly bombarded with messages and stories of those who do not or have not held the authority given to them or taken by them well. There are some obvious examples from the political scene worldwide and in this country. There are examples, sadly, within the church where authority has not been held well and in some cases abused. There are also examples where, despite someone's best efforts to hold and exercise authority well, they are lambasted and hung out to dry by social media. So how do we hold the authority given to us well? How do we truly serve in our leadership? How do we model Christ-like leadership and authority? When we think of servant leadership, a model of leadership that I'm often told by those exploring a call to ordination is a model that they aspire to, we are often drawn to the actions of Christ at the Last Supper as he knelt at his disciples' feet to wash the dirt from them. It is an act of service, an act of humility. It makes real Jesus' desire to be the one who serves. 
In this act, he demonstrates humility, makes clear that nothing is beneath him. He takes the lowliest role in that situation. And through this action, he demonstrates servant leadership. Jesus humbled himself in that upper room. An act, an attitude, which was to be repeated as he journeyed to the cross. This simple act of washing his disciples' feet, this simple act of humbling himself before others, was to be repeated time and time again in the following hours. As he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The servant king, the ultimate example of servant leadership, shows us the way by kneeling at his disciples' feet with a bowl of water and a towel around his waist. As Jesus held the authority given to him by God, he washed the dirt from his disciples' feet. However, there is a danger in stopping there. There is a danger in saying that servant leadership looks like a humbleness which says, I will take the lowly path. Because that presents only a partial picture of Jesus' leadership, of how Jesus held the authority given to him well. And he ignores the reality that there are situations and times when the exercising of leadership and the holding of authority requires us to do the upfront leading, to get off our knees, to remove the towel from our waist, and to lead, to direct, to make decisions, to take responsibility. And that task can be as sacrificial as a task of placing the towel around our waist. I'm always struck that following Jesus washing his disciples' feet, St. John goes on to record Jesus returning to the table and teaching his disciples once again. Jesus takes the upfront role again. He sits at the table again. He takes the seat which he questions in our passage from Luke's Gospel this morning. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is not the one at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. In the previous chapter of John's Gospel, we are told that Jesus' own feet were anointed by Mary and wiped with her hair. Jesus received the ministry offered by another. Within the space of a few days, Jesus' servant leadership was demonstrated by the humility of washing his disciples' feet, by the acceptance of another person's ministry to him, and by leading from the front. In all of these things are marks of Christ's leadership. Examples of how to be a servant leader. Then how can Jesus sit at the table and yet be the one who serves? What is underpinning all of this which we might use as our guide in determining whether we are exercising our own leadership well? Whether we are holding the authority given to us well? Well, I wonder whether it's simply this to ask ourselves the question, what do the people of God need me to do or be in any given situation? And most importantly, what does God need me to do or be in any given situation? What does God need me to be or do? Asking these simple questions as we exercise our leadership ministries 
to lead us away from self and towards Christ-like servant leadership. This is what I believe Jesus did as he washed his disciples' feet, but also took his place at the table. By asking these simple questions, we might be able to discern well those times when it is right to put the towel around our waist, when it is right to step up and lead from the front, when it is right to have the humility to receive the ministry of others. It's so simple and obvious, and yet it is all too easy to fall into the habit of not doing so. It is so simple to feel the need or pressure to continue to lead from the front, to make decisions, to take responsibility, to plan, to make things happen. That our ability to see those times when we need to simply place a towel around our waist can become blurred. It is equally easy to be the other way inclined, to be too comfortable with the towel around our waist, that we become reluctant or nervous about God's call or the need of God's people for us to step to the table and lead from the front. It is incredibly easy for us to feel like we have to be superhuman, to believe what's projected onto us and not to recognize that at times God and God's people are asking us to be humble enough to receive the ministry of others. The humbleness of Christ's servant leadership is not to do with the action of leadership. It is to do with the way we hold that leadership and authority. It is to do with our attitude. To be ones who serve means that we put self aside and lead as God and God's people calls us to. Sometimes that will be sacrificial as we take the lowly path and wash the feet of others. Sometimes it will be sacrificial as we take responsibility, make the difficult decisions and bear the load. Sometimes it will be sacrificial as we recognize our own need for the ministry of others. Sometimes it will be sacrificial in putting aside what we want. Sometimes it will be sacrificial as we are called to step into uncomfortable places or roles. But in that sacrifice, there is joy to be found. In the sacrifices of Jesus' servant leadership, there was ultimately joy to be found. As hard as the road to Golgotha, Golgotha was, that road ultimately led to the joy of the resurrection. As hard and as long as our leadership journeys are, we live in the hope and the promise that the resurrection joy will come. Servant leadership, when we let go of self, let go of control, can be hugely costly, just as it was for Jesus. But it is where joy is to be found. In doing the will of God, we will find fullness of life. This is what we are called to in our various ministries, to lead as Jesus led, to not seek after greatness for ourselves, but equally not to shy away from the call to lead and hold authority on behalf of God's people and in response to God's calling. We are called each and every day and in every situation to deny ourselves take up our cross and follow him wherever that may take us. 
for those of us whose following of God has led us to a place of leadership in his church. Our task each and every day to exercise our leadership, to hold the authority given to us well with God's will at the centre. As we renew our commitment to ministry today, I invite and encourage those of us both lay and ordained whose ministry includes a ministry to lead, to renew our commitment to the daily task of listening to what God and God's people need us to do or be in any given situation. And as we do so, may we know the humility of Christ as we put self aside and wrap the towel around our waist. May we know the courage of Christ as we stand tall and lead God's people with confidence. And may we know the humbleness of Christ to accept our need of the ministry of others. May we da daily learn to lead and to hold authority that's been given to us well, so that more and more we may become greater reflections of the God we serve and the servant king who we follow. My brothers and sisters, thank you for exercising the ministry you are called to in your leadership of God's people. May you keep God and his people at its centre. And even when the road is tough and the sacrifice hard, may you find the joy of the Lord in his service and fullness of life in doing his will. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. Dear friends in Christ, at his last supper, our Lord Jesus Christ gave his disciples a new commandment, that they should love one another, and he prayed that they might be one. He gave them an everlasting sign of his own love in the sacrament of bread and wine. He consecrated himself to his father's service to be the high priest of the new covenant. I invite you now to dedicate yourselves afresh to his service as stewards of the mysteries of God and ministers of his grace. To all present this morning, I ask, in baptism, Christ makes his own and calls us to follow him. Do you renew your commitment to him as the way, the truth, and the life? Amen. To my brothers and sisters, readers, and lay authorised ministers. When you were commissioned, you undertook to be faithful in prayer and by word and example to minister to those for whom Christ died. Will you do all in your power to witness to God's love for his people? to all of us who share the ministry of a deacon. At your ordination as a deacon, you received the yoke of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. Will you continue faithfully in this ministry to build up God's people in his truth and serve them in his name?
to all us, all of us called to the priestly ministry. At your ordination to the priesthood, you took authority to watch over and care for God's people, to absolve and bless them in his name, to proclaim the gospel of salvation, and to administer the sacraments of his new covenant. Will you continue as faithful stewards of the mysteries of God, preaching the gospel of Christ and ministering his holy sacraments? At your ordination as bishop, you received the gift of the Spirit that you might lead the church in mission and send out ministers in Christ's name, that you might promote its unity, uphold its discipline and guard its faith, and that you might teach and govern the people committed to your charge. Will you continue faithfully in this ministry, watching over Christ's own flock and building them up in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? By the help of God, I will. May the God of peace sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who called you is faithful, and he will accomplish it. Amen. Friends in Christ, Pray for all who minister, that they may be constant in prayer and steadfast in faith, and serve your people with joy. Pray for your readers and all who exercise lay ministry, that the Lord may continue to inspire them in their ministry, and gift them with confidence to share the gospel. that the Lord may pour upon them the riches of his grace. Pray that he who has called them to his service may make them worthy of his calling. Lord, Pray for your priests. Ask the Lord to bless them with the fullness of his love, that they may be faithful ministers of his word and sacrament and lead his people in the way of salvation. For your bishops, that they may be faithful to the great trust that has been handed to them. Pray that they may become more like our good shepherd and great high priest, the teacher and servant of us all, and so become more and more a sign of Christ's loving presence among us. Pray for the families of all those who minister, for their homes and for all with whom they share their lives. May the Lord in his love keep us ever close to him, and may he bring us to all the fullness of eternal life. Amen. Merciful Father, He has set his seal upon us, and as a pledge of what is to come, has given the Spirit to dwell in our hearts. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And our faith.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The oil for the anointing of the sick and dying. Blessed are you, sovereign God, gentle and merciful, creator of heaven and earth. Your word brought light out of darkness, and daily your spirit renews the face of the earth. You anointed son brought healing to those in weakness and distress. He broke the power of evil and set us free from sin and death that we might praise your name forever and ever. By the power of your Spirit, sanctify this oil for our use. And may those who are anointed with this oil in your name be made whole in body, mind, and spirit, restored in your image, renewed in your love, and serve you as sons and daughters in your kingdom. with the cross at baptism. Blessed are you, sovereign God, the protector of all who believe in you. Your anointed son overcame the powers of evil and was lifted high upon the cross. By the power of your spirit, sanctify this oil for our use. And may your blessing rest on those who are anointed with this oil in your name. As they come to the waters of baptism, may it be for them a sign of your defense in their fight against sin, the world, and the devil, and bring them to share in Christ's victory. Blessed are you, Lord, sovereign God and Father, upholding by your grace all who hear your call. Under your old covenant, priests and kings were anointed to serve you, and in the fullness of time your anoint you anointed your Son by the Holy Spirit to be the Christ, the Saviour, and the servant of all. By the power of your Spirit, sanctify this oil for our use. And may your blessing rest on those who are anointed with this chrism in your name. Let it be for them a sign of joy and gladness as they share in the royal priesthood of the new covenant and make known the kingdom of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit we lift our voices of thanks and praise. Pour upon the poverty of our love and the weakness of our praise, the transforming fire of your presence. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and good always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. By the outpouring of your Spirit, you anointed him to be the servant of all and ordained that he should enter into your kingdom through suffering. And now he stands by us, and pours out for our healing the oil of consolation and the wine of renewed hope. In your wisdom and love, you anoint your holy people to be a royal priesthood, to share in Christ's suffering and to reveal his glory to the world. Therefore, earth unites with heaven to sing a new song of praise we too join with angels and archangels as they proclaim your glory without end.
holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of Christ As a father calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of Mary, Auburn and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Standing at the foot of the cross, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper.
Let us pray. Good Shepherd, you have welcomed us at your table and have anointed us with the oil of gladness. May your goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You have opened Father, whose glory fills the heavens, cleanse you by his holiness and send you to proclaim his word. Amen. The Son, who has ascended to the heights, pour upon you the riches of his grace. Amen. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, equip and strengthen you in your ministry. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. 